Well, good morning. It's good to see you. So glad you're worshiping with us this Sunday before Christmas Eve Sunday. I especially want to give a shout out to our online audience that's watching with us, Aldersgate on Online. And we're in the Christmas story, so I hope you brought a Bible with you this morning. Uh, grab it and go to Matthew chapter 1. Uh, find the Bible app on your phone. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, reach down there in the seats in front of you and grab one of those Bibles. If you need a Bible, that's yours. Take it with you. If you know someone who needs one, it's theirs. Take it. Uh, gift it to them this Christmas. Uh, as you're getting to Matthew chapter 1, let me remind you that next Sunday is Christmas Eve. So our worship um, schedule for Christmas Eve services here at Aldersgate is as such. Uh, we'll have three opportunities for you and your friends and your family to gather with us. Uh, the first of those will be Saturday evening at 5 o'clock, and then Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. So just one service on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, and then also Sunday evening at 7. All three of those services will be identical. So our Christmas Eve services are some of our most loved Christmas, uh, services. Uh, we'll gather together. The worship team will lead us in singing some Christmas carols. Uh, I'll sh share a very brief message. That's your favorite part of the Christmas Eve service. Um, we'll share in communion, uh, and we'll have a great time of candlelight at the end of the service. And so, again, all three of those are identical. You choose which one works best for you. And then I'm already praying for whoever it is you're going to invite to come with you uh, to the Christmas Eve service next week. So uh, our 10 o'clock service on Sunday morning, if you're traveling, if you're out of town, we'll live stream that service. And so you could uh, jump online at 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. All right, so we are in the Christmas story. And what we're specifically doing in the Christmas story is looking at the places in the narrative where an angel shows up and says, do not be afraid. It happens on four different occasions in the Christmas story. The first one is Zechariah. We were there a couple of weeks ago. He's a priest. And in Zechariah, we see our own fear when the angel shows up of disappointment. But we learned that there's always hope. Anytime there's fear, there's always hope. And the hope that we see in Zechariah's story is the hope of finding healing and freedom. Last week, we looked at Mary's story and how the angel shows up and tells Mary not to be afraid. And, and Mary must have had feelings of inadequacy and, and not being enough. I'm glad you suffered through that message last week because none of us ever feel inadequate or not enough, right? And, and we learned in Mary's story that we all have favor given to us by God. And the hope is leaning into the favor that God has already given us, not because we're good enough, not because we can earn it, but because he just loves us that much. This morning, we're going to look at Joseph's story. And in Joseph's story, we're going to relate to the fear of rejection and shame. Again, maybe you'll just suffer through it because I know there's probably nobody in the room who suffers from the fear of rejection and shame. I'm just preaching to myself this morning, but maybe you'll enjoy the journey with me, all right? So let's look at Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18. And here's how Matthew tells the Christmas narrative. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. He says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. What way? Well, it's important for us to realize that Matthew tells the story from Joseph, Joseph's point of view. Luke tells the story from Mary's point of view. But now we get the story from Joseph's point of view. Uh, Joseph is an interesting character in the Christmas play. Uh, I grew up in First Baptist Church, Earth, Texas, and every year at Christmas, we would have a children's Christmas play. And one year, I got to be Joseph in the Christmas play. This is where you all applaud and clap and, and cheer, right? And uh, it, it was really fabulous because have you ever noticed the role Joseph has in the Christmas play? Think about it. Here's what I did. I had one scene where I came up on stage and I was greeted by an angel. The angel did all the talking and I just stood there. 
And then there was another scene where I was responsible for bringing Mary, the star of the show, up on the platform. I had to make sure she was comfortable. And then I just stood there. You, you may or may not have realized this. Joseph never utters a word in all of Scripture. Now, he is spoken to and he is spoken about, but we never get anything that Joseph says recorded in Scripture. In fact, back up with me just a little bit. In the first part of Matthew chapter 1, Matthew, because he's also uh, writing to a very Jewish audience, gives us the lineage, the genealogy of Jesus. And when he gets down to verse 16, to the very last generation before Jesus, here's how he writes it. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. The star of the show, right? Like, sometimes in life, actually, a lot of times in life, I'm referred to as Amy's husband. Oh, you're Amy's husband. I love it when it's said this way. Oh, you're Amy's husband? <laughs> yes, the star of the show. Listen, God's favor, okay? I don't know what to tell you. So Matthew tells us the story from the point of Joseph, who never says one thing. Yet, Joseph is vitally important because of what God said to him and what God did through him. And, and as we look into these feelings that Joseph may have had about rejection and shame, let's preface it by saying Joseph doesn't really have a big part in the Christmas play. You with me? All right. So, the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. But let's talk about this betrothed thing for just a second, okay? We don't really understand this in our culture because we would just think of it as engagement, but it's so much more than being engaged. There were literally three phases to getting married in first century Jewish culture. The first phase was called engagement. Engagement was orchestrated and organized by the families. And they would bring two young people, teenagers together and say, hey, we think this would be a good fit. This would be a good match. Let's put them together. But this was all done in secret with the families. It was not a public thing. That was engagement. Then they moved to this place of being betrothed to one another. And that means it became public. So now everyone knew of the engagement, the private engagement that had happened between the families. However, being public, they were not living together as husband and wife. They didn't have the rights of living together as husband and wife. And this would last for about a period of a year. But they took this betrothal period so seriously that the only way you could get out of it was divorce or death. In fact, in the culture, there was a, there was a phrase that, that if a, a young woman was betrothed to a young man and that man died during the betrothal period, it, the, the young woman was called a virgin who is a widow. They, they took this very seriously. And after this year-long commitment, then they would become married. They would live together as husband and wife, and the marriage would be consummated. That's important for us to understand in the story because it was during this betrothal period that Mary must have given the news to Joseph. Listen, from Joseph's perspective, he had not been told any of this yet. He must have gotten from Mary what the angel showed up and said, to her. Now, 
from Joseph's perspective, he never utters a word that's recorded in Scripture. But what must Joseph have been thinking? My guess is one of two things. One, Mary's been unfaithful. Or two, Mary's unbelievable in a negative kind of way. Like, like from Joseph, he's completely human, right? Let's remember that Mary and Joseph were completely human. And, and, and Mary shows up to give Joseph this news. I mean, certainly he was like, okay, like human logic here, all right? Either one, you've been unfaithful to me, or two, you've gone crazy. You're unbelievable. And Joseph is contemplating all of this. Verse 19. And her husband, Joseph, remember, he's referred to her as husband, betrothal, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. You could only get out of it by death or divorce. But we're told Joseph was a just man, a righteous man, and so he chooses not to shame. Hang on to that. Not to shame Mary and to end their engagement, their betrothal, quietly. And I love this verse, verse 20. But as he considered these things as he was thinking about these things, as he was mulling over these things in his head, as he was going over and over and over these things. And that got me thinking. As Joseph was considering these things, what would I say to Joseph? I, I, as a pastor, I, I get the insight. It's, it's humbling, honestly. I get the insight into many people's lives. I've had many people come and visit with me, men and women and couples who are in very um, perplexing circumstances. But it's always such an honor and a privilege to be invited into that space with them. So I got to thinking, what if Joseph said, hey, can I talk to you about something? Like, this was... Between Mary and Joseph to this point, as far as we know, nobody else knew. What if Joseph gave me the privilege of being on the inside of this story? What would I say to Joseph? What if he came to me and said, bro, like, the weirdest thing, the wildest thing, the craziest thing. And like, I don't know if Mary's been unfaithful or is this, is she just, has she gone crazy? Is this unbelievable? Like, what would I say to Joseph? Joseph, thank you for inviting me into your story. I hurt for you and with you. But Joseph, what if Mary's right? What, Joseph, what, what if, Joseph, what if Mary's telling the truth? What, what if she hasn't been unfaithful? What if... The story she's telling you is really true. What, what if Mary's right, Joseph? What do you feel, Joseph? How are you feeling about that? I don't know what Joseph would say back, but he might say this. If she's telling the truth, if I'm going to be the earthly father of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, then I don't feel equipped for that job. I don't feel like I'm enough. I don't feel like I'm adequate for that job. And I'd probably say, Joseph, bro, man, good news. Last week, I preached this killer sermon about not feeling good enough, not being adequate enough. You should really go check out that sermon, Joseph. So we're going to skip past that part right there, okay? Here's what I think Joseph might say. If Mary's right... And we begin to tell everyone the story. We're going to have to because she's going to start showing. Like, 
people are going to think we're crazy. People are going to think I'm crazy. People are going to think we've lost our minds. People, people are going to start not wanting to be with us. People are going to start like separating themselves from us. People are going to start like running from us because we're going to be called those kooks. We're going to be called the crazy people. Like I, I'm really worried. Here's what I think Joseph might say. I'm really worried that we'll be rejected by our family and our friends in our community. Rejection, if we're honest, is one of our greatest fears. Finding ourselves alone, it's really not the rejection as much as it is being alone, isn't it? Because God wired us to be in community. He created us to exist and live in relationships. And the loneliness and the isolation kills us. It's happening in our world today. We're now a couple of years past COVID, and we're seeing all of these studies that are coming out about what happened to the relational isolation during COVID. We also live in what they call the digital age, where we've been more connected to human beings than we've ever been before in the history of the world, yet we're more lonely than we've ever been. Because connection happens here, not here. I think Joseph was fearful of ending up alone. I, I get that. Amy and I get that. I'll just tell you one story. It was December of 2009 that I was appointed as a senior pastor at Aldersgate. Christmas 2009 was the first sermon series I ever preached as a pastor. I'd preached, but the first sermon series I'd ever preached as a pastor. And leading up to that time, we had some other pastors, some good friends in our lives that sat Amy and, down, Amy and I down and said, listen, you're about to experience some changes in your life. Let, let us tell you about some changes that may be coming your way. Let us tell you about some things that are probably going to be happening. And there was a whole list of things, but here's one of the things that they shared with us. They said, listen, some of the relationships you have in your life right now, they won't exist six months from now. And Amy were like, I mean, we didn't say this to them because, you know, but we were like, you're crazy. Like, we've had friends, like these friends for a long time, like, they're close friends with us, their relationship. No, but because you become the pastor and because you become their pastor, that relationship's going to change. Whatever. This was December of 2009. The Christmas, I mean, sorry, the New Year's Eve party we went to every year, we didn't get invited to that year. And six weeks later, the Super Bowl party that we got invited to every single year, we didn't get invited to that year. And today, these years later, none of those people even attend church here or exist in our relational circle. Like, I understand what Joseph felt. And my guess is you probably do too. And here's what I would probably say to Joseph. Joseph, I get it, but I really think there's something deeper than the rejection that you may be scared to say out loud. And, and I, I think, Joseph, what you may be really dealing here with is not so much the rejection, but what's lying under the rejection, and that is not being understood, right? Right? Like people, you, you're having a hard time understanding Mary, so you probably think people are going to have a hard time understanding you, and you're not going to be validated, and you're not going to be accepted. And all of that, Joseph, is this thing that we call shame. Right? 
Right, Joseph? Like, isn't this ironic? You want to divorce Mary quietly because you don't want to shame her? But Joseph, let's be honest with your own feelings. If you believe that Mary is right, you're dealing with your own feelings of shame, of telling this story out loud. Listen, I'm still talking to Joseph, but not really. Shame loves secrecy. Shame lives in the dark. And shame does not want us to tell our story. Shame doesn't want words wrapped around it because shame can't stand being shared. The most dangerous thing to do with an experience of shame is to hide or bury the story. Because when we do, it's like a cancer that metastasizes. The thing shame can't stand is when we begin to tell the story even at the risk of rejection. So let me ask you, what would you say to Joseph? What if Joseph called you up and said, hey, can you have lunch? Hey, can we do coffee? And he began to tell you the story and began to get honest with you about the feelings of rejection and shame. What, what would you say out of your own place of empathy and your own rejection and shame in your life. Let's look at what the angel said. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold... An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. Joseph, I know the rejection. I know the shame. Joseph, do not fear those things. Do not try to keep this hidden. Do not try to keep it quiet. It, it is a cancer that metastasizes if you do that. Deal with the risk of rejection, Joseph, because... That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, here's where I think the connection between fear and faith is. We've been talking about fear for three weeks now, and every time we see fear, there's always hope. But I also believe every time we see fear, there's an opportunity for deeper faith. Listen to me. I think we often set fear and faith up as antagonists, opposites, that they're completely different, that they don't work together. We saw this during COVID. You can choose fear or you can choose faith, but you got to make a choice. I don't believe fear and faith are antagonists. I believe fear is a doorway to deeper faith. I believe fear can be an opportunity for a doorway to open up to deeper faith. See, a little bit more about my story. Before I made that transition in December of 2009, before I came into full-time vocational ministry in 2006, I worked as a physical therapist. And let me tell you something about rejection. I was getting burnt out in the world of treating patients every day, and so I began to apply for these administrative positions because what was I thinking? That's so much more fun, right? 
Apply rejection, apply rejection, apply rejection, apply rejection. And can I just be gut level honest with you? I knew some of the people that were getting the jobs and I'm like, I could do a much better job than they can. You've been there, haven't you? But here's what I learned looking back. Those rejections were an opportunity for deeper faith. Had it not been for all of those rejections, I probably would not have lived in a state of holy discontent, allowing me to step into where God was really calling me to step into. Fear and faith are not opposite. Fear is a doorway to deeper faith. So Joseph, the angel, saying, listen, do not be afraid. Yes, I know the risk you won with rejection. I know the shame that you're going to deal with this in this culture. But Joseph, God is calling you to a faith you can only imagine right now. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. You know the irony of the story we're going to pick up here on our Christmas Eve service is that Joseph and Mary were rejected. Were they not? They have to go to Bethlehem because the census is going to be taken, and not only that, Old Testament prophecy said that's where Jesus would be born. Funny how God works those things out, right? And the innkeeper, poor fella, he doesn't, he's the one that gets words in scripture and they're the worst words ever. There's no room in the inn. Rejection. People have been rejecting Jesus for years. But that didn't keep Mary and Joseph from finding a place to bring the Messiah, the Savior of the world, into the world. And so whatever you and I are up against today where the risk of rejection is real and that shameful story is there, Jesus challenges us to find a place to step into deeper faith. So I'm going to pray. The band's going to lead us in a song. The altar ministry team's going to come forward and they'll be here at the front. the Holy Spirit's just inviting us into a space today to say you've been keeping that story covered for a long time and you may think it's actually helping you but it's actually hurting you today's the day to share that story to step into deeper faith Maybe you're here and God's been calling you into a deeper step, but you fear the rejection. You fear what's going to change. You fear what's going to happen in your life. And today is the day the Holy Spirit's saying, take that step. Oh, you may be rejected, but the places you'll go with God will be so much deeper and better than you could ever have imagined. So God, today in the places where we resonate with Joseph, The irony of him wanting to divorce Mary quietly so as not to shame her, but dealing with his own shame. God, may you help us deal with our own shame today as well. And may you remind us of the Mary, uh, the, the angel's message to Mary. We are favored. And no story that we've kept secret can take that away from us. And so God, today, take us to deeper places by giving us a voice to that story, words to that story. God, in the places you've been calling us, just like you called Joseph, may today be the day we say, I'm your servant. I'll do whatever you're asking me to do. I'll risk rejection to go to a deeper place with you. So Holy Spirit, do your work. 
Move among us, hover over us as you did Mary. We surrender to you.